for them, then this will uh, obviously benefit not uh, only that uh, country which is contracting the soldiers, but also the country that is allowing these uh, soldiers to be contracted. Uh, this, this is uh, exactly the principle of the comparative advantage. And uh, then we're moving to uh, how uh, the soldier, for example, uh, would also get better, uh, some, some benefits. It's a completely a win-win situation. Why? Because in these benefits, uh, they, they would receive the training from the other state which is contracting. They would have the expertise and the experience of uh, working uh, in that way, and that uh, working opportunities would also uh, uh, be uh, helpful for uh, their own uh, possibilities. We're having, uh, finally, the test of its a decision. It, uh, it's a decision of the soldier to participate in another country's uh, work, for example, or to be contracted or accepting the contract that the other uh, country is uh, offering. And our last uh, argument is a, a valuable experience. It's uh, helping other countries in a different uh, circumstance. For example, if a country has expertise in a certain kind of thing, for example, uh, Colombia, in, uh, in uh, the 80s, it had a very uh, international recognized war on, uh, war on wars. And what is happening actually in Mexico? In Mexico, the strategy is completely foolish, and it has uh, given uh, 6,000 of deaths in six years of government. This cannot be allowed. So it's the duty of the state to get the intelligence of any kind of soldier, because there are different ranks of soldiers, obviously, and uh, to get this expertise and protection for their own state, then uh, this would allow, for example, effectiveness. If Mexico would have, for example, uh, contracted soldiers that are uh, ex combatants or they have a part of the intelligence of the Colombian uh, 80s uh, decade, then we can, uh, for example, have this kind of uh, better intelligence and this better strategy. So I will uh, finally review our three arguments. We uh, talked about the allocation of resources, the macroeconomic benefit, and the valuable experience. And uh, this is proving uh, completely that the countries have the right to allocate the resources they have in the best way in order to achieve uh, either a national or an international objective. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your speech time. Uh, yeah, I just said concept. Are you timing? Oh, could you like let us know when there's... Yeah, I will let you know after every minute how much time you have left. We have two minutes. No, uh, just
uh, conflict, then they would have this comparative uh, benefit. Okay, thank you. So, uh, what about dictators such as Gaddafi? He hired private mercenaries and he extended the war. Are you okay with that? Um, no, we're saying that, uh, for example, this take here. So, uh, isn't that principally inconsistent if you're not okay with, if, if you're saying that you're okay with the Arab allowing all states to do so, are you restricting it or not? Uh, no, what we are saying is that uh, we're with better uh, have like the uh, state using this kind of information only for the best interest of the of the population and the same states. For example, we are not limiting it to inter to national uh, examples. We can use it in national examples, such as Mexico, for example, and uh, with all that uh, big uh, kind of, uh, of messy. So, so you're okay with allowing dictators to do this so that they can just impose their rule? Furthermore, carry out like no, human rights. No, we're just saying that this should be implemented if this would assure the security, for example, of all the population and uh, would avoid this kind of uh, massive uh, killings with nonsense. So, you think that a person who's already been paid in the case of hiring private armies and has no emotional link to a particular cause would actually be loyal? Yes. So, what if you say you, have, you hire one soldier and he's fighting for one army? And then another army, say country A is fighting against country B. Country A hires the soldiers paying them this amount. Country B says, well, we're going to pay you much more than that. When they say, okay, we'll fight for you. Well, finally, it's in their decision. And we're just taking uh, into consideration that it's necessary so to take all the your, decisions. So you're, in your world, soldiers have no loyalty. They just switch between country and country? Um, no. Now we see a team affirmative of today that is okay with mercenaries but not okay with human rights violations. Well, we see that these mercenaries lack accountability and thus there will always be human rights violation. Case in point, Blackwater. Moreover, they concede that soldiers have a right to switch loyalties. And then they say that they are going to benefit the war on terror. They are going to benefit the war that they are fighting. No. Because once a soldier switches loyalty, you are not protecting the national interest that you propagate within the model of team affirmative. And thus we believe the team affirmative's role of protecting national interest does not stand from the very get-go. Moving on. We agree that each state has a right to allocate its resources, but we can test this on other levels as well. One, what if the resource, what if the allocation of these resources harm the other country? They talk about benefit. Now, what benefit are they talking about? Are they talking about the benefit to the entire international community? And are they going to benefit the entire international community once they hire these private armies which carry human rights violations? 
no ladies and gentlemen, and thus they are not even protecting the international interest that they propagate. Moreover, we firmly believe that even if you allocate your resources as you may wish, there are certain barriers. For example, you are not going to allocate your resources to fight an unjust war. We believe certain barriers to the allocation of resources exist and this is the main contention that Team Negative of today has with Team Affirmative. Moreover, they said this. It is a valuable experience having these paying these soldiers. You know, let's look at what they mean. Additional bombings, violence and death is a valuable experience. No ladies and gentlemen, we can seriously question the principles of Team Negative Affirmative of today. Moreover, they talk about we all have this simple question, they talk about macroeconomic benefit. Now we realize, even if we concede, concede to the fact that there are going to be benefits financially to the country, we believe the countries have evolved to a point where financial benefits are not the only consideration, but the entire idea is you uphold rights. You don't measure economy based simply on financial resources, but you have things such as the human development, in, uh, human development index. Moreover, Leaving you with that point, let's look at the stance of the uh, negative of today. One, we we'll talk about the detrimental effects on the war on the war effort. Secondly, we we'll talk about how it creates a violent, belligerent, and war mongering world. So, ladies and gentlemen, what is a war? A war is fought for patriotism. A war is fought for your own national interest, and it needs ideological fervor, and it is fought for the protection of your motherland. Leaving you with that, let's look at what is a soldier. Someone who is ideologi ideologically driven and someone who is intrinsically inclined to fight for your country. Are you helping the war effort once you pay these whole mercenaries? Now let's look at the paid soldiers. There are no guaranteed loyalties because they believe that there is going to be, they, they are okay to switch loyalties. Moreover, they could switch loyalties once they are paid more. Thus, the entire idea of the war benefiting you does not stand. Because a soldier can switch sides and benefit the other country and not benefit your war effort and thus not benefit the national interest that you propagate. Moreover, we talk about how these soldiers are not bound by a national oath. We also talk about how they cannot be court-martialed. Now once you have these certain mercenaries and once you have these private soldiers, we believe accountability needs to exist. And does that exist within the model of team affirmative of today? No. And are they going to benefit the world once there is a lack of accountability present within their model? No. Does the benefit that we pose to you stands with the model of Team Negative? For example, we have Blackwater in Iraq carrying major, major human rights violations. The country's war effort was affected and thus the national interest that they wanted to protect did not stand. Let's move on to the second line of argument on how it creates a violent, belligerent and war mongering world. Now let's understand how the world of today exists. There is disparity between the rich and poor. We've seen rich exploit the poor because they are more resourceful. Now rich countries can exploit this power that they have due to being more resourceful. Now they can, they can wage an unjust war in three circumstances. One, when, there is, when they want to occupy a country's natural resources. Secondly, when they want to fight a war of occupation. And thirdly, when there is a war of colonization and when they want to suppress political, political dis uh, opposition. We had this example in the case of Gaddafi, where people stood up for a revolution, but just because Gaddafi could hire these private armies, he was able to suppress political opposition. Now, does that cater to progress within society? No. Because we see that rational views, we see that sane views may simply be suppressed because of the violence, because of the power that you're giving them. And this leaves a room for exploitation that we seriously question in the model of team affirmative. Now you don't need pu public support to fight this war, all you need is resources. Now what does this do? This has three efforts. This makes war common because you have more resources and you're going to go into more war just because you have more resources and you're in the ability to go to a war because you don't need public support. Thirdly, it will create a military industrial complex and moreover, you see international efforts against violence. You see that international committees have been found to make sure that human rights are upheld. We've seen society evolve to a point where these fundamental values of protecting these individuals and suppressing violence has become really important. 
in the model of team affirmative affirmative of the day you're suppressing the international you're suppressing all these efforts and thus you're not benefiting the world so what does team of negative of today show to you we showed you on how once you even allocate resources there are certain barriers that exist we have also shown you how there will be a greater war and how there will be further violence within the model of team affirmative of today and for all those reasons we oppose strong So you said that there will only be faults to human rights if uh, some soldiers would be that? You said that there will only be faults to human rights? Yes. Do you know something of the war on drugs that Mexico is facing? Uh, yes. Good. Do you know that there are 60,000 deaths? Uh, yes. Well, therefore, can you say that, well, uh, these results have shown us that without even an army, there have been false human rights because there, are to there is torture, there are killings, there are arbitrary detentions. But these are other methods such as torture that we also want to suppress along with the efforts that you're going to have. Yes, that but, will be but, but if the, the government is not able to uh, establish these sections, what can you do? Mexico's strategy was uh, uh, to establish uh, social uh, a war against crime, but countries such as Colombia could uh, figure it out how to make a strategy to avoid such violence and to end the war. So, what uh, what could be the disadvantages disadvantage of making it? This is an inconsistency. Once you concede that countries have a re have the resources to allocate people into their army and pay them, and once you say that countries don't have the resources to allocate their own army, but if the uh, situations that Mexico has established, me as a Mexican, I can see that it was a total disaster. 
Many people go to the army, many people die, many innocents die. So if we could have a help from Colombian experts, we could make another thing in order to avoid this killing of innocents. So what could be, it be a disadvantage? That's another inconsistency. Once you say that you want to prevent, you want to protect lives, but you said that in the war people die. So how are you protecting the lives of the individual? Because if this Colombian expertise could come and show some of the strategy they shown, some of uh, the things they have established, we could see uh, how to uh, avoid the killing of these people in recent years. In fact, it is established that for some years, it is in some years, Mexico is expected to have more violence related to uh, to uh, the drug uh, the drug war. In fact, it is expected to have 100,000 people killed if this war is not stopped. So how could it be an inconsistency of all what you're saying that we could help, but we could take the help of this uh, intelligence to uh, avoid this war and avoid these killings? Intelligence is not army. What you're talking about is strictly intelligence and not army. No. What over the no. debate is not restricted no. to Mexico. The soldiers that have been established in Colombia have established intelligence, have established viable experience, as as we have established valuable experience that could help us to. Uh,
uh, they claim that this is they claim that this was not benefiting the country of origin. But as we explained in our second argument about the macroeconomical benefit, it is in fact benefiting the country. It's a benefit that is exclusive to our side, and it actually may may be productive because um, hiring soldiers from other places is actually um, a sort of international cooperation in order to attain the same end. They claim a lack of accountability, but they are completely misunderstanding the fact that even if they're fighting for another army, they're still fighting for an army, an army that is responsible for what his or for what its own soldiers does do. Even if they are hard, if they are hard soldiers, they are still soldiers of someone. They are still soldiers of a country, a country that is and should be held accountable for the things that these soldiers do. Um, moving on to their second argument about. Here they mention um, that there's a clear difference between rich and poor countries in war. And we agree, there is a difference, but that difference is already made clear with this allocation of resources that we talked about. We talked about um, there's allocation of resources for, for, for things like technology, for things like strategy, for things like ex expertise. And actually, allowing smaller countries, smaller countries like Saudi Arabia, like Luxembourg, um, that have the money but do not have resources to fight against big countries that have big armies in the United States might actually prove beneficial for their security. They mentioned the example of Gaddafi, and yes, but Gaddafi's abuses and his hiring of private armies actually led to international interest and to a NATO cooperation. Um, that uh, it was an international army, an international army that was loyal because it had the same objectives. It had, in, in the end, international benefits. They claim we're making war common, but then again, there's completely misunderstanding the fact that war already happens, war already exists. And thus, we do not believe that, that this will further will decimate international, international efforts in, against war, because war is already there. In fact, as we proved with our example of Colombia and Mexico, it would actually prove beneficial to end the, end the conflict faster. Um, but moving on to strengthen my own arguments. On our first argument about the allocation of resources, we mentioned that during war, countries allocate the resources, and this is something that already happens. A sad truth, but it happens already. Um, they allocate industry, they allocate territory, they allocate technology, climate, and experience. If a country has the money, they should be able to use it to hire soldiers if they need to, if they need to, to preserve the safety of their citizens, if their army is not enough. The impact of this argument is that it's only fair to be able to allocate all resources, including money. Mm. On our second argument about the macroeconomical benefit, we told you how, how, it, how this brings a benefit to countries that allow soldiers to get hired, which is exclusive to our case. It brings an economic benefit, and it's a benefit for the army of the country because they are able to receive better training. This is the job of a soldier. They are aware of the risks, and they follow a certain ideology. On our final argument about valuable experience, we told you how other, other countries uh, soldiers can bring valuable experience like strategy, uh, and uh, experience, or technology. They conceded or point about the war on, on about Mexico's war on drugs, which has been a complete and utter mess with over six, uh, over sixty thousand deaths because there's lack of a plan, there's lack of, pro of, pro of productive expertise, which compromises citizen safety. And how having experts from other countries that have already waged a successful war on drugs, such as Colombia, could prove beneficial. The impact of this argument is that this, um, this reallocation of resources helps make, uh, helps make a conflict shorter to and, and to further protect the security of our citizens. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, I beg you to propose this motion. Thank you very much. I'd like to remind participants, since you guys have a handful of preparation time, to please not speak in between or in middle rounds or speeches.
believe a dangerous country should have a nuclear program? Um, Carla? Do you believe a dangerous country should have a nuclear program? No. So you're conceding to the fact that there are going to be barriers to the allocation of resources? Allocation of resources already happens. Sadly, that's not the proposition's fault. No, but we're saying that if it is principally wrong, you can stop these countries from having this allocation of resources because it is not principally justified. Then I can answer it. That doesn't exactly benefit your case because you're saying that fair states could and should be able to have to allocate the resources. Only totalitarian states, sure. which are isolated okay. examples, should not. You're saying that these that a dangerous country should not have a nuclear program. So you would also have a dangerous country not having an army because it could also exploit that power as well. Or a fair country could use that power for the, for the good of humanity. But what about a dangerous country? Dangerous countries are isolated examples. Uh, but in, the, the in their regard, would you have a country with these certain private armies as well? That already happens, I was good with your example of Gaddafi. In the current status quo, those countries already do that. Human rights violations also happen. Uh, you have acts that are of violence that also happen just because they happen. Are you principally justified to say you let them go on? Of course not, sir. But hiring soldiers is not a violation. So, so you're conceding to the fact that you're not right to you're not right to say that it must go on, but you're only saying that just because it does, you will let it go on. We're not saying that it must go on. We what we are we're not saying that it must go on because it already happens. We're stating that it must go on because the countries have a right to allocate their resources and because it can actually bring, bring a tangible benefit to both sides. Do you have a right to choose? Yes. But if you're a minor, do you have a right to consume alcohol and exercise your right to choose? You also have a right to drink alcohol. No, if you're an underage person. No, you're not. So you're conceding that even if the right exists, barriers to that right exist. So if we prove that there is a tangible harm of allocating that right, which we've already done, and you've not shown us a clear benefit, we win this debate. We showed you a clear benefit with a clear example of how messy the war on drugs was in Mexico and how Colombia's expertise could actually be useful before 60,000 people Hold on are dead. The, are you paying the people of Colombia to fight your war? Of course not, because this is not... So the that does not fall within the ambit of the debate because it's only about paid wars. You could pay the Colombia. But you don't, because that is a collaboration that is taking place and thus Colombians the example not does working. not fall within the ambit of the debate. Colombians are not working with Mexico. Do you believe war should end as soon as the aim is fulfilled? Yeah. But you've seen examples and you have historical precedent where these private armies have continued these attacks. running under the assumption that because wars already exist, you need to give countries the right 
to allocate the resources more efficiently. What Team Negative is saying is that wars already exist, yes, but if you apply this policy, then in the future, the, uh, the possibility of these wars occurring will be so great that you will have a world in which there will be more wars, and because of this long-term harm, you don't need this policy. This is the case brought forward by Team Negative. What was Team Affirmative's reply to this? They haven't sufficiently tackled the long-term harms put forward by Team Negative. And the examples of Mexico and Colombia of how if uh, Mexico hired uh, soldiers from Colombia, it would benefit the war on uh, the war against drugs. Our first response to that, ladies and gentlemen, is that why can't uh, Mexico and Colombia collaborate? Why can't Colum uh, Colombia provide technical assistance to Mexico? Why do you need uh, and a second example, uh, second response to that is why do you need a blanket policy which will not only allow Colombia and Mexico to carry out this policy, but will also allow other countries, countries such as uh, uh, regimes such as Gaddafi's regime, to prolong this war or uh, this war uh, wars which are not beneficial for people at the end of the day. Why do you need a blanket policy? The principle that was brought forward by Team Affirmative was that countries have the right to allocate the resources they possess. Our first response to that is, firstly, there is an inconsistency present within their case. When, when we cross-examine them, that would you allow Gaddafi to hire uh, uh, soldiers of other countries, they said no. We think that this is an internal inconsistency within their uh, case and they're not principally consistent. Our second response to that is that the, this right isn't absolute. We agree that states have this right, but this isn't absolute and if there is a long-term harm present, then you can infringe upon this, these rights because in the status quo you don't allow countries, some uh, dangerous countries to carry out uh, nuclear programs because you realize that they have a right to allocate their resources but if there's a tangible harm which we have proven then this right doesn't exist. What was the uh, principle brought forward by Team Negative? We said ladies and gentlemen that our principle is that war is bad and in the future if you implement this policy the, uh, the possibility of wars in the world will rise to such a great extent that you will have a world in which war will become common. We think that principally team proposition, team affirmative has conceded to our case. How? The second line of argument is that they will, uh, is the macroeconomic aims and in, in which they're saying that there will be more jobs for people once you implement this policy. How will there be more jobs? Because there will be a greater need for war. Because there will be, the, because there will be a lot of war, you will need more soldiers, which will lead to more jobs. So the principle brought forward by Team Negative, Team Affirmative agrees to us, agrees to our principle, which is why we feel that Team Negative deserves to win this debate. There is another principle in this debate, and this is the uh, principle of international benefit and national benefit. Internationally, they're talking about allies, ladies and gentlemen. They're giving you examples of things such as NATO. We feel that NATO is not a suitable example and does not fall under the ambit of this debate because NATO uh, is a group of countries who are ideologically aligned to that same cause. You are not hiring people, hiring private military companies such as Blackwater to come and fight your war. And that is an international cooperation which does not fall under the ambit of this debate. The second principle is that your national safety, your national, your national aims will be fulfilled. We said a lot of things. Uh, uh, the soldiers might not fight properly because they've already been paid. They will switch loyalties, which will be detrimental for this effort, for this national security, because they're not bound by a rule. They reply to this is that soldiers are still fighting for an ideology. No, they're not. They're fighting because you're paying them to fight. They're not fighting to safeguard your motherland. They're fighting so that they can earn money and go home. They will fight because you're giving them money, they will fight for the person who gives them the most money. So where does this loyalty lie? Does this loyalty even exist? It does not, ladies and gentlemen. So that national, uh, sec uh, national security principle doesn't apply in this. And the third thing which was said was that there's a rich and poor difference which already exists within this case. Okay, so that this, dif this difference, even if we agree that this difference already exists, why do you want to exacerbate the problem? Why do you want to increase this difference? They gave you an example of how poor countries such as Saudi Arabia, ladies and gentlemen, will be able to hire these private military companies. If they're so poor, then how can they afford to hire these private military companies? If they're so poor, then the rich country can just hire those same companies to uh, fight against these poor countries as well. So they're not principally consistent here as well. And their last argument is that valuable experience. We don't think that uh, uh, war 
gives you valuable experience. What it does give you is death. What it does give you is misery, things we don't want, things we cannot and will never stand for. So for all these reasons, we're even. Like to invite the first, for, the first affirmative to process and the second affirmative. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for the for your discourse. But uh, according, for, uh, for example, to the opposition part, which are the means that the state had, or the instruments that the state had, in order to preserve itself and the security of the state? In order to preserve itself or its security, but it has its own army. If it's not, it has the other methods to carry out, for instance, carry out surveillance to uh, ensure that attacks are uh, carried out within its own borders or to have its own police force. There are a lot of ways to safeguard it, the safety of its own people. So, for example, are you saying that uh, why, why shouldn't, in an international way, these uh, same mechanisms would be applied? For example, if an state is uh, fighting either a national or an international uh, uh, fight against uh, a determined objective, why shouldn't this same principle of using, for example, the militia or the education or even the culture, which according to Althusser, are also means of the state to preserve itself? So we feel that in an international state, if some countries are fighting together for the same cause, then you don't need to pay these uh, soldiers to fight for the same so cause. So you're saying, for example, that the state would be uh, like having a uh, well, the soldiers that enter to this kind of militia have the same or share kind of the ideology that this state is promoting by the mix uh, of the fight of um, its war. Sorry, could you repeat that? For example, uh, won't you uh, be agree or won't you agree that, for example, 
uh, if a determined soldier is uh, entering into a militia of a country which is uh, carrying out a determined uh, action, would we agree also with the ideology that is behind? Um, yeah, but the ideology that is behind the soldier? That is behind the state carrying out that often that action. Look, if you allow other countries to hire to uh, to hire other soldiers to fight uh, their wars, then you have examples of what Gaddafi did. What, uh, for instance, when he okay, for example, someone, for example, if uh, this uh, is able, for example, to, for France to have a uh, nuclear program, is it okay for France to have a nuclear program? Yes. Uh, do you think so? We think that it uh, that a nuclear uh, program is not. It is okay for France to have a nuclear program. Yes. And for Iran? And for uh, Iran? Yes. Well, potentially yes. Poten no, potentially yes. Yes, why? Why is it okay for uh, Iran to have a nuclear program? Yes, why is it okay, okay. for Iran and France to We agree have that countries have, have the right to allocate their resources. But if there is a hard... Precisely, that's the point. So you're saying that the states exactly. have the, exactly the right to allocate their resources. But the if there is a long-term harm that is better present, then they don't have that right because... Are you that for example, uh, some uh, Western countries, so, such as the United States, say that Iran is uh, dangerous, for example, to be developing this kind of nuclear technology? If the, you can answer the question if you want. If the leader of that country is actively saying that he is going to go and bomb the rest of the world, then there is a long-term harm, and we don't think that he has the right to possess that uh, uh, right to allocate his resources. Thank you. On the third affirmative speaker to conclude the debate from the affirmative side. Here. My job as a third speaker is to crystallize the debate and show the class points in order to know what part has the right uh, part in this uh, debate. Firstly, we are going to establish our clash points, which are international and national benefits and totalitarian regimes. First thing that we can establish, war leads to more war, a point established by the uh, opposition side. We can establish a clear example. We are living in, in our own place, right? Mexico and Colombia. If Mexico could establish a, 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 um, as a strategy with, uh, with, a, with a, another country such as Colombia that has suffered the same, exactly the same killings in many things, but it has established a strategy that could eradicate the problem. So we could use that, uh, that uh, part to solve our problems as well. That is, the, it is shorter and makes the, uh, the, the conflict more effective. It makes that the effectiveness of, uh, of the strategy uh, to be to be clearer, to be uh, to be harder, 
and uh, to make it stop, that is uh, something that all the people, especially Mexicans, want uh, in the future years. Okay? The nature of soldiers, they say that uh, they have no loyalty, but if the, the soldiers are hired uh, in countries that they have no opportunities, they, have, they, can, they can have benefit, they can have money, and well, they are willing to risk their life because that is the nature of a soldier. He is hired for that. He is a soldier. We should stop war. Another point established by the opposition side. How can uh, not hiding soldiers stop war? They did not establish any point related to that. So uh, they are saying no because uh, Mexico cannot uh, continue, cannot hire or cannot use the intelligence of other countries because there are uh, human treatments and such things. Yes, how can you assure that it can stop? Many experts, as uh, uh, many of my well, my partners have stopped before. I've said that it is likely to increase in a dramatic way. So, how can not using these type of soldiers help us to uh, uh, to avoid this long destructive war that is going to uh, lead to a, a, a political instability of the Mexican state and not only Mexican state, but also other countries that have been part uh, of, of the same problem. Now, passing to our second clash point, which is the most important clash point that uh, this part thinks must be addressed. The totalitarian regimes. They establish that the totalitarian regimes uh, can also hide, hide soldiers, but they gave us the reason that uh, there are dangerous countries. They said, well, France and the United States can establish their nuclear program. But countries such as Iran cannot because of uh, the, the situation in their country. Okay? They have now, we can see that uh, Iran has problems with Europe, with the United States, and many other countries. But also, we must think in cases such as North Korea. Uh -huh. We must think that uh, the nature of states can be different. Also, we must establish that this part set that they were uh, in favor of our point of what we were saying. We were saying that Libya, for uh, it was their example, that could hire uh, other other uh, soldiers from other countries to uh, establish their war. But how they established also, well, we established that it was dangerous because many countries are dangerous. Uh -huh. Libya is dangerous by that time. Okay, then. Uh, my partner established to him that uh, Iran was also a dangerous country and he said, well, they cannot. So they gave us totally the reason. There is a main reason why these clash points were win by the uh, proposition side. Because the, uh, the establishment of an Australia that avoids a long destructive war, manslaughter and many violations of human rights can be uh, eradicated by the use of methods such as an ecology uh, and strategy uh, with valuable experience from other nations that have suffered problems such as this. So, that are the reasons and the clashes why we beg you to propose this motion. Thank you very much.
invite the third English speaker to conclude this debate. Good afternoon, judges. Thank you for your speeches. So, basically, ladies and gentlemen, war exists, so it's good. Rape exists, so it's okay. Theft exists, so let it continue. Genocide exists, so let's also allow that to continue. That today is Team Mexico's philosophy. But not only that, they want to make war 10 times more likely to happen, and they want to make unjust war a frequent occurrence. And that is what Team Pakistan is strongly against. Now, Team Mexico's burden today was to prove that implementing their policy would result in tangible benefits that would outweigh any harms. And let's look at how Pakistan has proved the exact opposite. Now, we believe this debate has boiled down to three major issues. Number one, is the state's right to allocate resources absolute? We believe it is not. Number two, is it important for soldiers to believe in their cause? And we'll also be talking about the just war effort in this issue. And number three, is a world in which war is made into a business really going to be a happy one? And we believe it will not be. Now, number one, ladies and gentlemen, why does a soldier fight? A soldier fights to protect their motherland. They have a strong emotional connection to their country. This is why they go out and fight. This is why they sacrifice their lives. Now, if you simply pay them, which you pay them in advance, you simply give them money and say, well, you go out and fight and then come back home, we believe there will be no commitment. They are only doing it for the money. In case of a just just war, the most important thing, ladies and gentlemen, is that your soldiers are that is that your soldiers are driven and that they have public support, that, they, that your public can relate to them and that they can relate to the public community because that is very important when you are fighting a just war ever. Number two, something that was not dealt with by Team Mexico is switching loyalties. Now in the cross-examination and in, my, in the next cases, we said that if you first are with one country and then another country, and uh, if you're first with one country and the country that they're fighting against pays you more, would you not instantly switch? Because in the end of the day, it's all about the money, ladies and gentlemen, and this is going to be incredibly detrimental to a just war effort. Now number two, which is, is the state's the right to allocate resources? Is it absolute, ladies and gentlemen? A state can allocate resources to absolutely anything. A state can allocate resources to develop cells to torture people. That does not make it right. At the end of the day, if a state has money, why not allocate resources to develop their own army than allocate resources to implement a policy that would not only plague and terrorize their own people, ladies and gentlemen, but the international community. And that is something that Team Pakistan does not want in any circumstance. Now finally, is a world in which war is made into a business really going to be a happy one? And we seriously beg to disagree on this count. Now, we agree that this situation in Mexico is unfortunate. But ladies and gentlemen, this debate is not limited to Mexico whatsoever. Okay, this debate is not limited to Mexico whatsoever. Now, your ass uh, 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 that team Mexico's assertion that Colombia would actually help is not strong enough on its own to have them win this debate. The potential for Colombians to stay on after they've met their desired aim, ladies and gentlemen, and then pursue their own interests is far more uh, is far more detrimental and would seriously outweigh any benefits. We, on the other hand, Team Pakistan, have given you examples of how in the past these armies, such as Blackwater, Black, Blackwater, such as Gaddafi's mercenaries, have caused mass human rights violations, ladies and gentlemen. And that is why we believe that this point also stands. Their second argument in itself is a concession to our entire case, ladies and gentlemen, that you have more jobs because there will be more war. In their first speech, they came out and said, well, there won't be more war. But their case begs to differ, ladies and gentlemen. There clearly will be more war. What they're doing is buying and selling soldiers, which is the strongest catalyst for war. They talked about international collaboration. What international communities hope to do is eradicate war. By implementing their policy, that entire aim would be left futile. They completely dropped their entire point about wealthy countries using this money, using this policy to occupy other countries, to grab their natural resources, ladies and gentlemen. Our entire point about unjust war was not taken care of by Team Mexico. But so therefore, ladies and gentlemen, because we have a pragmatic side, a side that is based in the real world versus a side that has based their case on one example and that is not keeping real world implications in mind, we strongly affirm this motion. Thank you all for this very nice debate. I encourage the debaters to cross the floor and shake hands. 